Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. It's a great turnout today. I'm so grateful to all of you for being here at our last What Matters to Me and Why of the Year. Before we begin, I just want to make a few quick announcements. Tonight, we're hosting a film called God in the Box. It's an interesting documentary that explores small questions like, what is the nature of God? <laughs> and um, we really hope you can all join us. It's going to be at the School of Cinematic Arts, Room 108. That's the Ray Stark Theater tonight at 7 p.m. The filmmaker will be there. And our very own Reverend Dr. Chip Cecil Murray, who is here today, uh, one of the great civil rights icons of our times and one of the great leaders on our campus and city, uh, was featured in the film, and he'll also be part of the panel discussion this evening. So I encourage you all to be there. God in the Box, 7 p.m., SCA 108. Also, um, it's not often that Hanukkah falls during the school year, the calendar, the, the academic calendar year, but this year it does. So uh, on Monday, this coming Monday the 10th, at 4 p.m., we're going to be lighting the menorah at um, Tommy Trojan. It's uh, open to everyone. The provost will offer some remarks. The Trojan marching band will play some songs. Uh, you'll probably get some latkes. It'll be nice. So uh, Monday, 4 p.m., Tommy Trojan, menorah lighting. Uh, everyone's invited. And finally, um, we're going to do an alternative winter break trip this year. We haven't done that before, but we are aware that many students, including many international students, are on campus during our break. So December 20th to December 22nd, um, it's a three-day trip. Uh, we're going to be focusing on nature in Los Angeles. So we're going to go to different nature reserves and hikes and parks in LA. You can see hidden Los Angeles. Um, if you're interested, you'll be staying at the Radisson Hotel, um, and you should contact Rabbi Lori at Hillel. Her email address is Rabbi Lori. Uh, at gmail.com or the Office of Religious Life website has more information. So as you all know, this is um, uh, our, our series, What Matters to Me and Why, is in our 12th year. And I think one of the reasons we've been so successful is because we really think deeply about how do we bring together the spiritual and the scholarly? How do we feature scholars and um, st um, um, leaders on our campus who are thinking deeply about the big questions of meaning and purpose and identity and authenticity in their life? And uh, today we have a student who's an alum. He's uh, graduated in uh, 2011 who will introduce our very special speaker, Nicholas Warren. And I'm really honored to be able to introduce our student who also brings together the spiritual and the scholarly very well in his life. Jake Block was a religion and music major, graduated in 2011. And he made this extraordinary film for his uh, honors thesis that had me in conversation with Nick Warren. And that's how I first met Nick. It's called Awe, The Science of Spirituality. I encourage you all to go check it out on YouTube. And uh, it's me and Nick in conversation with each other talking about the creation of the universe. I talk about it from a Hindu and Buddhist perspective. He talks about it from an astrophysics perspective. Plus, his accent gives him all sorts of IQ points that make him seem, you know, even more intelligent than me. And he already is so much more intelligent than me. So anyway, it's a great film, uh, All the Science of Spirituality. After Jake graduated, he went on a trip to India, but not just any trip. He drove a motorcycle for six months from Ladakh, Leh, the northernmost tip of India, to uh, Kanyakumari, the southernmost tip of India, uh, with a video camera. So I look forward to the film that comes out of that. Um, so uh, please join me in welcoming our student, uh, our alum, to introduce Nick Warner, Jake Block. Well, thanks to Dean Sony and to Professor Warner uh, for organizing this and, and presenting today. Um, the matter at hand has twofold meaning. Now first, uh, Nick is going to give us a very stimulating discussion today. He never fails to engage his audience. And second, the matter at hand is indeed the air around us and the very stuff that our hands have, are made of. Uh, it's, it's the stuff of stardust. Now I first uh, we all have a cursory understanding of this concept that we're all made of stardust, but I first started to think deeply about it and understand it after I took Professor Warner's class during my sophomore year here at USC. Now, in his class, we, we journey through the universe from, from uh, end to beginning, backwards in time. We start here on Earth, and we examine the celestial sphere and the constellations above us, and then we push further back in time to distant galaxies and fertile nebulae and vacant black holes. And we go all the way back to the very beginning, uh, the beginning of time, the beginning of everything, the Big Bang. And when I finished his class, I came away thinking about two fundamental principles. Uh, on the one hand, 
that we are microcosmically deeply connected to space around us, that we have a deep sense of meaning and purpose here, that we're all stardust. And on the other hand, that we are very, very insignificant within the vastness of all space and time. And so as uh, Dean Sony mentioned, I made a film about this that featured those two called Awe. And uh, what the film ultimately does on one level, it talks about the parallel narratives between uh, Indian religious philosophy and science, but on another level, it examines um, the profound sense of meaning and purpose, awe, that I get from reconciling two extremes, one is, one is which uh, my insignificance in the universe and my place in the universe as a child of the stars, as somebody who shares DNA with the cosmos. And that's a very unique feeling uh, that, I, that I originally found in exploring the concepts that I learned in Professor Warner's class. And so without further ado, I welcome Professor Nick Warner and uh, thank him for sharing with us today. Thanks, well, one of the privileges of being a professor is that you frequently, or fairly frequently, get to talk with students about what really matters to you. Though often you have to do your duty as well and talk about things that are essential but perhaps don't matter so much. The sort of intellectual equivalent of washing your socks. Necessary but not very exciting. Um, but what makes this forum so special is that it enables one to venture outside the realms in which, one norm well, which I normally speak in astronomy and black holes and things like this and talk about something that's very important to me but for which in the university we don't usually find some kind of outlet. I'm thus very grateful to Varun, Jake, and the Office of, Office of Religious Life for this opportunity to make a complete fool of myself. However, I'm, what I want to talk about and what I care about passionately are stories, how we create them why we, and why we believe in them. We construct stories to help us understand the nature of the universe, and also we construct stories to gain a sense of self and cultural identity. Stories are in that sense the universal glue that holds us together socially, but enables us to gain some understanding of what the universe or the cosmos is like on almost every level. It's therefore critical to understand why we believe in some stories and not others. Why do we believe that we live in a universe that's 13.7 billion years old? Why have we discarded much of Aristotelian science, like the fact there are four or five elements, air, earth, fire, water, and if you live in outer space, ether? Why is it considered silly today to hug a tree? And yet, a president is required to believe in God and talk to him on a regular basis. What enables us to vigorously contest some, contest some ideas and some stories and yet requires us to step back and say, I respect your deeply held belief. Given that a belief in God is an act of faith, how do we decide what God or gods are acceptable in a president or in our political leaders? Why is Catholicism, Mormonism acceptable? Perhaps Judaism or Buddhism? Perhaps even Scientology? But what surveys tell us is that being an atheist is completely unacceptable in a president. In case you haven't guessed, I'm, I'm an unreconstructed atheist. However, when my children were young, I spent, my wife and I spent lots of time and energy convincing them that there were fairies at the bottom of the garden. We evolved these wonderful, elaborate flu, food and flower rituals and took pleasure in the blessings of fairies. Every year, my wife and I constructed all sorts of incriminating evidence and forensic data that showed that Santa and the Easter Bunny had done a bizarre kind of home invasion robbery where they left stuff rather than took it away. Why did we do this? We also taught our kids about ancient myths. We talked about religion, and we did talk about God and the Bible. This was not some Machiavellian trick so that when the kids discovered that the tooth fairy wasn't real, they would also get beyond God. My wife and I taught them these things precisely because they are first and foremost myth, the myths and fables that give us place in and an understanding of our culture. Some stories deeply resonate with our emotional experience and give our lives deeper meaning and form connections with others in the world. For a scientist, the fairies at the bottom of the garden is an amazingly wonderful construct for kids. 
It stimulates their imagination. It gives them a sense of wonder about the universe. It gets them to understand that there might be things going on out there that are beyond their immediate ability to see and hear and perceive. With encouragement, they become curious. They ask questions. They learn to look for evidence. They, they basically form hypotheses and look for mechanisms and behaviors. Ultimately, they discover that some theories are not sustainable and other theories I have a better empirical explanatory power. So maybe it was a Machiavellian trick to put God in his proper magical context. But more importantly, and I think most importantly, as my kids made transi the transition from magical thinking to evidence-based thinking, and the garden fairies faded in relevance, the sense of magic, wonder, possibility, and play moved on and, did, and grew and was simply channeled into a much more wonderful world based on atoms, cells, and photosynthesis. Stories and the telling of good stories enable us to make the transition from the magical to the evidence-based and gain by doing so. As an empiricist, as an atheist, I take the view that there is a remarkable and objective universe to be explored. It obeys some surprisingly simple but very rich laws and there is absolutely no observational evidence for God. There is simply no role for magical thinking in the universe that I've come to understand. However, as a humanist, I find the universe deeply beautiful and awe-inspiring, and I'm constantly amazed by the depth of understanding we can attain. For me, this is deeply magical. That probably represents my appalling knowledge and lack of and complete ignorance of neuroscience. So like any kid, I'm going to take pleasure in the magic until my colleagues here tell me how it all works. From my worldview, though, come two very, very important imperatives of my life. One should use evidence-based analysis to understand what one can about the objective reality in the, in the universe, whether it be using physics or neuroscience or economics. The other imperative is that one should have a complete and full human experience of all that the universe can offer. To love, to have friends, to pursue, pursue dreams, to have ambitions, and laugh whenever possible. Stories are a crucial part of both enterprises. Stories thus help us understand the world we see and experience and explain how it works. And stories are integral to our human experience of that world, helping us gain a sense of self and make connections with others and form a cultural identity. However, there are some extremely important differences between these two roles, and to fail to appreciate the differences is to court disaster. In science, stories are a sort of shorthand. They help us convey information and meaning. When I teach my astronomy class, which I'm delighted to see several people here have been there, I tell a story. I mean, when I set up the class, it's all about story. I do not take my audience through every single excruciating detail of every calculation, every experiment that's ever been done. I do basically use our common cultural heritage to basically make shortcuts so that I can convey essential truths about nature. Underlying those stories, if you look and peel back the layers, you will find incredibly rich amounts of science where scientists have filled in all the gaps. And we have the full force of the scientific method, prediction, reproducibility, and mathematics. But if you look deeply enough, and if you're lucky, you'll find a gap. That's the gap where creativity and research begin. It's really important to find these things, and if you're very lucky, you'll make the story change. The stories we tell about ourselves and co our culture help us understand who we are. Fiction and role models are very, very important. For me, it was Doctor Who. I wanted to be a Time Lord when I was eight and travel the universe in a TARDIS telling everybody what to do. I grew up. I work with Stephen Hawking and I work on the quantum structure of black holes. Not a far cry, but stories like that have immense power. Even now they have power. Not long ago, I spent about three weeks doing an incredibly difficult collection of calculations to try and show that something Something was true, but I knew it was impossible. I knew that I couldn't do it, but I wanted to do it anyway. I wanted to make a stable, supersymmetric wormhole and show that it could be an integral piece of the structure of the quantum black hole. Put in plain terms, I wanted to make a time machine. I failed, 
but I still hope. In fact, I cherish the whole ideal of Don Quixote, and like Lewis Carroll's White Queen, I firmly believe that everybody on a regular basis should try and do six impossible things before breakfast. Stories that give us identity and help us understand who we are are thus of tremendous personal importance. Stories also give us ways of connecting with other people and reference to those stories um, give, us, uh, give us a way of forming those connections. Things like live long and prosper, use the force, accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. I hope you don't snip that one out and use it as a, uh, a sound bite from this talk. <laughs> So anyway, these things define us as human beings and give rise to our sense of who we are. This is why we tend not to challenge them out of respect for the individual. To attack the story is to attack the person. The problem with such cultural stories is that they have many dark sides. They can be used to hide reality instead of reveal truth. Some of us come to believe that cultural stories must be universally applied and fail to realize when they cannot and should not. From such impulses come not only crusades, but the desire to impose democracy on other countries from outside. Perhaps even more insidious, some of us insist on the literal truth of cultural stories or scriptures, and this becomes impo more important than the individuals and cultures they're supposed to inform. When a cultural story cannot evolve, or takes on infallible truth, then it stultifies inquiry, cuts off questions and discussions, and deadens our hearts and souls. On a larger scale, such a culture will begin a slow stagnation. When those lines have been crossed, cultural stories must be vigorously challenged and questioned in public fora, because to do otherwise is to do more harm than good. We must no longer accept the hateful social politics and attitudes that draw heavily on Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. We can't evolve a sensible public policy on drugs, human trafficking and, pro and human trafficking and prostitution unless we can see beyond our cultural baggage and not fire surgeons general for merely suggesting we study the problem. There are dangerous and damaging obsessions in arguing for the literal truth and infallibility of foundational documents, whether it's religious manuscripts or if you advocate the strict constructionist interpretation of the Constitution. The people who wrote these documents were brilliant. They were wonderful, amazing people, and they deserve to be revered in our culture. But they simply do not have the data and the experience we now have. And these stories have to evolve. The stories told by science are usually designed and constructed to be universal and reproducible anywhere in the universe. Astronomy is, in fact, or much, mainly about testing precisely that hypothesis. What makes science so powerful is that the stories also evolve. Sorry, stories are, are challenged on a daily basis by experiment, and the stories evolve based on the outcomes of those experiments. And only the very best stories actually survive. It is the business of science to determine the value and accuracy of theories. This is done according to how or whether those experiments, sorry, those, science, those theories are confirmed by experiment. Put in the simple, basic terms, science tells us what we can as a society bet on a particular theory. And every day we bet our lives on theories of electromagnetism, aerodynamics, if you've ever flown, quantum mechanics, if you used any electronic device, general relativity, if you use the GPS system, there are many, many examples on which our society's existence is bet on theories. We also have fairly good evidence for the fact that there have been five major mass extinctions in the last 600 million years. We are now seeing the same evidence for the entry into the sixth mass extinction, and guess who's causing it? It's us. Part of this is climate change and global warming. What should we as a society bet on this? The science consensus view and the view of scientists is clear, yet the politicians still resist. On the other hand, going toward, back towards cultural stories, you can't take an evidence-based approach to a cultural story. To test the experimental reproducibility of Shakespeare or the Bible and then correct it according to the result is to entirely miss the point of the story. 
What hypothesis is being tested in Hamlet? The point is that such stories provide an invaluable lens for looking at the human experience of the universe. They are essential parts of our culture and they deeply resonate with our experience and emotions. But they do not represent universal, testable, highly re reproducible parts of natural laws governing everyone and everything in the objective universe. To ask that they do that is deeply misguided and completely misrepresents their true value and importance to humanity. Yet, to our continuing detriment, we continue to misapply and misunderstand the role of stories. Our cultural and humanistic stories continue to overwhelm evidence-based stories when they shouldn't. There are many ridiculous examples of this, and believe me, I'm gonna go into some of them, um, but they come from all parts of the political spectrum. Simply put, we indulge in magical thinking. We think in terms of stories when we should be using evidence-based stories, I should say cultural stories. Worse, we allow our leaders to go unchallenged when they engage in magical thinking. And we often do this out of respect for deeply held beliefs. If one, as a scientist, if I hear about the death of a friend's mother, my visceral response is sympathy and empathy and concern for my friend. I don't trot out a fact that puts it in context, like, oh, 160,000 people die every day on the planet. On the other hand, it is also part of our common lexicon that when there's a natural disaster, a fair number of people look at it as an example of God's vengeance, and some people look at Middle East and foreign policy through the lens of the Book of Revelations and the Second Coming. Given the season, my recent favorite was the uh, Halloween's public policy poll. It revealed that 48% of Republicans believe in climate change. That's good news. But 68% of the Republicans believe in the possibility of demonic possession. The problem of magical thinking goes much deeper. Daniel Patrick Moynihan once observed, and made the simple observation, that everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. It would seem that this is no longer true, particularly in politics. Ron Suskin wrote a piece in the New York Times eight years ago where he reports a conversation with a senior aide to President Bush. And I'm gonna quote Ron Suskin here and his experience. The aide said that guys like me, Ron Suskin, were in what we call the reality-based community which def he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I, Ron Tuscan, nodded and murmured something about enlightenment principles and empiricism. He cut me off. That's not the way the world really works anymore, he continued. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating new realities, which you can study too. And that's how things will sort themselves out. We're history's actors and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. In the last decade, this has got completely out of hand. The press seems to have given up all responsibility and even aid and abet in the process. The fourth estate should be leading the charge in the battle against magical thinking. Instead, they remain silent, presumably out of misguided respect for deeply held beliefs. As Lord Chief Justice Hewitt once remarked, not only must justice be done, it must be seen to be done. So it must be with empiricism and rational thought. Empiricism and enlightenment must be seen to be done. At the height of the British monarchy, only the court jester could be forgiven for telling uncomfortable truth in the presence of power. Yet in spite of our First Amendment rights, it seems that now only the late night court jesters are the ones who are showing us how deeply and damagingly delusional we have become. Stephen Colbert turned everything into a meme, turned the whole thing into a meme. Miriam Webster's word of the year, number one word of the year in 2006 was, somebody here must know, truthiness, thank you, truthiness, which, Merriam-Webster goes on and defines, using Colbert's first definition, truth that comes from the gut, not books. Or the, or the second definition, two, 
the quality of preferring concepts or facts one wishes to be true rather than concepts or facts known to be true. The problem is now an epidemic of magical thinking in the public at large. We want our cable TV, our bread and circuses, our social services, Medicare, roads, freedoms. We want a balanced budget, but we don't want to pay taxes. And politicians tell us we can have it all, so long as we vote for them. Magical thinking is particularly acute in the Republican Party. There are many easy targets, like Michelle Bachman. However, what I really care about, what really concerns me, are the far more insidious but less visible manifestations of this. The lunatics really are, in fact, running the asylum. Start with the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology. One member is Todd Aitken, who appears to believe that women have magical defenses against pregnancy after legitimate rape. Whatever the hell legitimate rape is. Paul Brown, another member of the committee, said, all that stuff I was taught about evolution and embryology and the Big Bang Theory, all of that is lies from the pit of hell. The chair of the committee, the current one, Ralph Hall, when asked about the effects of humans on climate change, responded, I don't think we can control what God controls. These are members of the House Committee on Space, Science and Technology. They're the guys who decide who how to fund research. Going to the Senate. Senator Marco Rubio, currently touted as a Republican presidential candidate in 2016, is in fact a member of the, the Science and Space Subcommittee of the US Senate. And just a couple of weeks ago, he was asked, how old do you think the Earth is? His answer, I'm quoting, at the end of the day, I think there are multiple theories out there of how the universe was created, and I think, it's in, think this country is a country where people should have the opportunity to teach them all. I think parents should be able to teach their kids what their faith says, what science says, whether it was the Earth was created in seven days or seven actual eras, I'm not sure will ever be able to know that. It's one of the great mysteries. It isn't a mystery. It's 4.54 billion years old. And the story of how we figured it out is a testament to the remarkable brilliance of humankind in understanding the universe. The modern story starts with astronomy and mathematics and physics, figuring out how the solar system formed in the first place. It then involved geology, and the, the idea of land formation, how long it takes a landscape to erode. And that early geology in the ninth century indicated the Earth had to be hundreds of millions of years old. Then there was the other nemesis, Darwin. The whole subject was driven for a period by evolutionary biology and how long it would take for the genomes of various animals that we now see to evolve. The story itself is packed with all sorts of wonderful human frailty and mistakes and errors but it was finally nailed in the 20th century by, through the study of radioactivity and nuclear fusion. It is one of the most awe-inspiring stories and one of the greatest triumphs of humankind. And frankly, it's much more awe-inspiring and riveting than Genesis. If you accept Genesis over the story of actual formation, you are doing yourself a huge disservice. It is also an evidence-based story, and you can bet your life on it. Not that I can think of many contexts of how you might do that, but okay. While these politicians might seem like the lunatic fringe, the genie of magical thinking is now so far out of the bottle that like Senator Bush, uh, President Bush's aid, you can move to an entirely different reality of your own creation. It's the kind of thinking that leads to the belief that the cure to every economic problem is to take two tax cuts and call me after the election. But it's not only the Republicans who engage in such magical thinking and ridiculous exhibition, exhibitions of truthiness. There are many broadly believed but very damaging fictions. President Bush initiated the idea, but many others have signed on to the belief that the multiple acts of terrorism that have been acted against the United States occurred because they hate our freedoms. Most of the le our leaders, including President Obama, tell us we have the best healthcare system in the world. We're actually 37th, according to the World Health Organization, wedged between Costa Rica and Slovenia. We rank, of course, well below most of Europe, 
and even significantly below Morocco and Colombia. Again, one cannot have a rational discussion of public policy unless we exercise these demons that we so want to believe in. The list of magical fictions is almost endless, and we fail to question them, not only because of the mythic respect that we have for deeply held beliefs, but probably because of another fiction, that we have the best system of government in the world. Even, presidential, even professorial President Obama has his own brand of truthiness. He's brilliant at giving us visions of hope, change, were not the red states and the blue states, were the United States. But this creates a reality distortion field that replaces what is with what might be. The road to his visions involves an awful lot of hard work and compromise when you start from the reality that we currently have. And he has not yet provided the necessary leadership when it comes to actually the enacting the details of bringing his vision into reality. When a politician has visions but does not exhibit the essential interest in the pragmatic details of making it actually happen, then this is just simply another form of magical thinking. In spite of this, I think the present tragedy is that the party of Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt has been brought low by magical thinking. I really do want, contrary to what you might think, a strong and functional Republican Party. One of the most important elements of democracy that often gets lost and grew up in the parliamentary system is the concept of the loyal opposition. Any idiot like Mitch McConnell can try and block every piece of legislation so that President Obama becomes a one-term president. But the key emphasis should be on loyal. The whole point of a loyal opposition is that it should make, the minority party should make constructive, responsible ideas and changes bounded by the loyalty to the fundamental interests and principles of the nation. Vigorous and credible opposition improves legislation and makes the country better. Magical thinking is ruining the Republicans, and in so doing, it is compromising our democracy. If anything is unpatriotic, it's magical thinking. So what is, the what is it that the Republicans have failed to understand, that children learn as their thinking evolves from the magical to the evidence-based? I want to come back to the fairies at the bottom of the garden. The importance of the fiction that my wife and I created for our daughters was that every idea was open-ended. The stories encouraged questions and opened hearts and minds to new possibilities and suggested deeper investigations. The stories enriched and inspired and helped them grow. Cultural stories are an important part of who we are and we must honor them. But governing our lives requires we understand the difference between evidence-based stories about the objective universe we inhabit and cultural-based stories that are a lens for observing that universe. A sense of a cultural identity is very important, but one must learn to discard cultural stories when, they have, when they have, their relevance has become, they become irrelevant or have become truly a truly damaging obsession that prevents any form of loyal and credible opposition. As a society, we have to become sophisticated consumers and users of stories. We must understand the limits of the validity and reliability, and whether it's based on evidence or not. We must not settle for nostrums and comfortable fictions of cultural history. We must challenge the stories we're told. Terrorists attack us for a lot of complicated reasons, but some of them have to do with our foreign policy. And we simply do not have the best healthcare system in the world. It is a mess. The problem with stories that all the politicians tell us is their truthiness, the triumph of wish fulfillment and self-deception over evidence. What makes it worse is that they are the worst kind of stories they tell us. They are formulaic, prescriptive, proscriptive, closed-ended, and stultifying to further thought. They provide answers that are not. In both science and culture, good stories, the ones that are truly valuable, the ones that reveal, are the ones that reveal truth and deeper truth about the universe and the human experience of it. Such stories encourage progression and growth, and above all, they invite many follow-up questions. There is, I think when it comes down to it all, in the end, there is really only good storytelling and bad storytelling. 
and we have been on the receiving end of an awful lot of garbage. And it's time we cried enough. I thank you for listening. We, we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'm supposed to act as ringmaster. Any questions? Thank you for the one. Thank you for the talk. Um, would you like to share any tips for students of science and practicing scientists on how to prioritize between doing science and being seen to be doing science? Because we have a social responsibility also to popularize and to fight the epidemic of magical thinking out there. But the, there's another priority of focusing on a methodological training and doing research as it should be. Mm -hmm. So how do we avoid being torn between these two and have them mutually reinforce each other? It's a really, really hard balance to strike. I mean, you know, frankly, what I, what I just want to be doing is working with my students, calculating stuff about black holes. But I was offered an opportunity like this, and I jumped at it, because I get to say things. I occasionally blog. When something really hits me, and I'm offered an opportunity to talk about it, I just go out there and do it. You know, blogging, you know, you might have an audience of three, but, but still, just going out and saying things in public, talking to people, you know. It, it, I teach general education, because I love to tell the story of what we've achieved, but also I realize that that's the last time I'm going to talk, get to talk to people about science. So any opportunity you've got for a captive audience who, of non-scientists, you get to talk to them, seize it with both hands and do the best damn job you can. That's, uh, and fi uh, the balance is hard, and some of us work primarily on research and occasionally make forays like this, and there are people like Brian Green who are out there, and Clifford Johnson to some extent, out there really pushing the, the public knowledge of science. But, you know, it's, I find that the, the wall one is up against sometimes is, is so difficult because there's just so many people out there who are pushing the other direction. Question. Thank you for a great talk. I just want to have, I just have one question. Do you think us as, us as a human race will get rid of the epidemic of magical thinking once and for all? Whew, a very complicated question. Um, I sus how to put it? Magical thinking in its own context is, f I, I, I love it. I mean, you know, I, I, there are the story of our cultural stories define who we are. They're very, very important. But when that magical thinking moves into another sphere, that's when it becomes dangerous. So I hope that the magical thinking just gets reined back into its proper context, which is your personal identity and your personal experience of the universe. I think we probably have some genetic inbuilt structure that requires that wants us to make this kind of you know cultural story to explain who we are but i do hope that we can learn what the appropriate sphere for that activity is and not let it influence um our, the, the the things that are appropriate to evidence-based thinking and i I'm, I'm optimistic that we can do that it's just i've seen in the last decade we've been going very much in the opposite direction but also I really think what's happening to the Republican Party is an absolute tragedy because it's been hijacked by a bunch of magical thinkers. And, you know, I, I used to have a, I, I'm a firm Democrat, but I, had a I have a friend in England who used to say the difference between an old conservative and a new conservative is at least the old conservatives knew when they were doing wrong. And I think going back to the old conservative model is certainly better than the current version. So well, the reason why I'm saying what I'm saying today is precisely because I see it's become an aberration which is very, very unhealthy. The, you know, 50 years ago, you know, it was almost too much the other way. It, technology was perfect and wonderful, and you should install it, spray DDT, and do all sorts of other things without thinking about it. Ricky. I'm sure you do. Ricky was in my astronomy class, probably the most vocal member of any class I ever had. <laughs> <coughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of magical thinking and national tragedy or, national dis or natural disasters and how scientific thought or scientific explanations aren't nearly as satisfying when people are suffering, right, as, you know, um, you know faith-based kind of uh, reconciliations or, 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 or cultural rituals. How do you, or where science is placed in kind of trying to, trying to explain those tragedies to the people who, who suffer from them. I think when you first meet somebody who's suffering from a tragedy, the first response is empathy and sympathy. It, it really has to be. I mean, you want to connect to that person because they've just suffered some horrible thing. You, of course, you want to use your science to make sure that 
horrible thing doesn't happen again or happens minimized in the future. And the discussion of the scientific context something comes later. But it, it's, there is, again, there's an appropriate sphere for the usage of both kinds of story. But the immediate response for anybody who's had a terrible loss is the, you know, the empathy, the sympathy. It doesn't have to involve God. It just means that, you know, you want to have, you know, there are fellow human beings that feel for you and are sympathetic with you. I mean, you know, being an atheist, you know, whether somebody wishes me, when somebody wishes me, you know, get praise for me, I interpret that as being somebody who just cares about me enough to spend some time thinking about me during the day, and I'm delighted that they do it. It's a very important thing to me. I interpret it through my own cultural lens, but then the whole point is, after the disaster settled, after you've helped the human beings get over the trauma, you have to get the science out, and you have to fix the problem with evidence-based methods. Down here. Uh, oh boy, a written one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, go for it, please. Okay, so my question is, um, I had heard that uh, you know President Obama was talking about how scientists are on the decline in the United States, that the population of young people who want to become scientists is declining. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, as an educator, um, do you feel that this is a result of magical thinking, or this is what causes magical thinking? I, I th OK, so there are two things I need to separate off, one of which is we're talking about people at the sort of higher end who are going to become scientists or engineers or work in STEM-related careers. Magical thinking, they're way beyond that. The magical thinking really, I think, comes from the society that aren't scientists, that the people who've had perhaps a very bad high school education in science, they've had very poor exposure, they may use used of textbooks that are severely compromised in their content. And so really, it, the, the whole epidemic of magical thinking starts with the education of young people and not giving them formulaic answers to difficult, complex questions, giving them open-ended answers so that they follow inquiry. That's the really, that's the really important starting point. So that's the magical. Th now, to be honest, magical thinking in politicians, we get the politicians we deserve. And so they are responding to focus groups. They're responding to the people they think who want to hear this. And so if the problem has to be addressed at the most fundamental educational levels, it's not the decline of scientists. Those guys are already, you know, they're, they're not magical thinking, most of them anyway. Um, it's really the education of young people, kids. You know, don't tell them formulaic things about why flowers grow. Start telling them all sorts of wonderful stories and then make those stories more sophisticated, but always make those stories open-ended and encourage thought and follow-up questions. And it's really the, at that end of things we have to work much harder. So, you know, Teach for America, all these things where you go out and do it. But also on the political level, fighting for the contents of textbooks. One of the reasons, the, you know, more personal story, you know, I always was something of an agnostic atheist, but what made me come out firmly and stand up and be counted as an atheist was Dover, Area Board of Education, but Kitzmiller versus Dover Area Board of Education. It was the intelligent design debate in the Dover Area School District. And finally I thought, okay, the line's been crossed, damn it, I'm gonna start making life miserable for other people on that. And at some point, there are major geopolitical fights that have to be, have to be had. And I have to say one thing about the Dover Area um, decision. Um, Judge Johnny Jones was a George W. Bush appointee. So, you know, there were some good people appointed by George Bush. And he, of course, destroyed any possibility of intelligent design in the Dover Area School District. We've got about two minutes. Hi. Uh, as the Voyager spacecraft nears the end of our, uh, sort of the edge of our bubble, yep. um, what facts and stories do you think it might reveal to us? Oh, it's still, it's just crossing outside the magnetic sphere of, our, of, of, of the solar system. I mean, I find it just wonderful that we've sent a piece of technology that far out, and it's still working. It's still sending us signals. Um, as regards what it'll tell us, I don't think it's going to tell us an awful lot more. It's going to send back a little bit of data. I may have to eat humble pie on that at some point, but uh, 
its instruments are barely functioning, it's still in contact with us. It'll tell us a little bit about how the magnetic field changes as we cross out of the solar system. The solar system is dominated by the sun's magnetic field. And then there's the magnetic field of the galaxy, and there's a transition between the two of them. And we'll get our first measurement of the orientation, the behaviors of that magnetic field. Kind of cool stuff, but I just find the whole thing just... You know, I was asked to do a, a piece recently on the guy who jumped out of this balloon at... Uh, yeah. And uh, there's a YouTube video of me talking about it. And for me, the science wasn't the important thing. It was the fact that there's a guy standing above the Earth at goodness knows how many miles off and flinging himself out of the spacecraft and doing that thing. It's inspiring. And I think that's the role for Voyager. It's just an inspiring piece of stuff. Richard, did you have a... Yeah, I time, so perhaps... One quick one. Uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. I thought it was provocative, and I thought it was dead on and interesting in so many ways. I just wanted to ask, the, the appeal, the reason why magical thinking gets moved out of the arenas in which it's most productive, into the arenas where it becomes counterproductive, is because it's per so persuasive. It talks about what we're afraid of, and it talks about what we wish were true. So against that, how does reason compete with those two really compelling reasons to believe? the things we're afraid of, and the things we most desire. How does reason stand up to those in the, in the arena of public opinion? I actually had an experience of this. When I was at Barnes & Noble a few months back, um, I was looking at the science bookshelves, and there was about three columns. And then there were three columns of pre-teen vampire romance. <laughs> I have a photograph. I'll probably blog about it at some point. But, but yes, there's this morass of stuff coming at us and coming at our kids. To be honest, I... I think we just try and be the best teachers we can. But, you know, I have no objection to people. In fact, I love people to read wonderful, inspiring fiction, the Doctor Who thing. But the point is to find the balance on our lives between the objective universe we're trying to understand and our human experience of it. And there has to be some pushing back against the current just morass of stuff coming at us. Magical explanations are easy and they can be put into sound bites. Real science can't. We just... Look at the IPC super report on climate change. It's a complicated idea, and it's human cause, but you know it can't be put in a soundbite. Not like it comes from the pit of hell. Do we have time for one more? One more. Okay, back there. The guy in the red T-shirt. Um. Do you think that what you call magical thinking could ever be an acceptable substitute for things beyond the limit of human knowledge? Okay. Sort of like a band-aid over the unknown? I'm an empiricist, so the only answer I can give you to that is that, in, a th the, the, in some sense, I look at nature and look at stuff that presents, and I build models, I try and figure out what's going on, I try and figure out mechanisms. If it doesn't present itself as a phenomenon to me, it doesn't exist. And so things that are beyond the unknown or beyond the known operationally don't exist for me. So that's my answer as a scientist. I mean, I, I, of course, my answer as a humanist is I would like to imagine all sorts of wonderful things and all sorts of incredible things, but then the genie really is out of the bottle. And, you know, it might be in five minutes, God will pluck me out of this auditorium and say, well, you did pretty well with that model. Would you like to try the more complex one and put me back into a new universe? I mean... So once you allow beyond the issues of beyond the realm of what we know, I have to really answer as a scientist and empiricist and say, it doesn't exist, I can't measure it, I can't see it, I can't do anything with it, therefore, for the moment, it doesn't exist. It might bite me in the ass later, but, you know. So, sorry. I think we probably better cut it off. I think Varun's giving me the wind-up. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, so much for sharing this, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we hope to see you do this again next year, sometime soon. And on behalf of the What Matters to Me and Why Committee, we'd like to present you with this journal so that you may continue to record what matters to you. <laughs> Fantastic. So, and it says you. on the cover, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. I think that's nice. Thank you very much. Thank you.